Hey y'all, how's it going? Sorry for not having any videos over the last month or so. I've been extremely busy on field work, which means some really cool stuff that I'm going to be able to show you. Today I'm just focusing on a trip that I went over, went on over those last few days. Uh, and in particular, we're going to be talking about Matoranga Māori, or traditional knowledge of the Māori people, and how it relates to this field work we were doing. So we went to a place of extreme cultural significance to the Māori people, and in particular to the Nabui Iwi that live there, the Nabui tribe that lives in this area. It's an island that the English called Pierce, Piercy Island. Uh, it was named that by Captain Cook, but its traditional name and the name I'll be referring to it as is Motu Kakako. So Motu means island and Kokako is a bird that lives here. Um, it's right next to Cape Brett. Cape Brett is on the mainland and then right off of that is Motu Kokako. Cape Brett is thought to be the first place on mainland New Zealand, Aotearoa, that um, the Māori when they first arrived landed at. And Motu Kakako is thought to be the first land in the Aotearoa New Zealand region that any of uh, the waka or canoes landed at. And that was the Tunui Arangi waka. Uh, they landed at that island, presumably getting food, getting to know this new place. It was the first time humans had ever set foot in the entire Aotearoa New Zealand region, coming from Polynesia up by Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji. So Mataranga Māori, the traditional knowledge of Māori people, in the past has been largely disregarded by Western science. Uh, and that's for many of the reasons that traditional knowledge has been disregarded in other places in the Americas and Asia and Africa and everything, because the Western style science was thought to be superior. That's not always true and often is not true, especially in environmental work. The people living on the land generally have pretty good knowledge of that land. It's what kept them alive. I'm going to tell you the story of Motukakako, how it was used by the Māori people, and try to be thinking this whole time about what can this inform modern science on? What can we learn from these stories and these practices and apply it to modern science? So Kokako is a bird here in New Zealand, known as a Judas bird, or like in the Christian story, uh, Judas betrayed Jesus. Kokako are Judas birds. They betray other birds. And that's because they can imitate the sounds of other birds. So if you put a Kokako in an area, it will start imitating the calls of the other birds and get those birds to call back to it, and you're able to find those birds. So if you're trying to eat those other birds, it's really nice to have a kokako there to get the birds calling, to get them uh, to give away their position. So for that reason, the Māori people took some kokako, put them on Motu Kokako, and that's where it got its name, and left them there. Let them breed, let them uh, propagate themselves, so that if they ever need a kokako to go act as a Judas bird, then they would be able to go out to the island, take some of them, bring them back uh, to wherever they're doing the foraging, wherever they're doing the hunting, and they have their Judas bird. So already, we can start thinking, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us Kokako don't leave islands when you put them there. They aren't very good flyers. It tells you that they were living on those islands at least once the Māori people put them there. And it tells us a bit about how you would be hunting and ways that this might have influenced some of the habitats and some of the birds across there, as well as telling us a lot about Kokako's behavior. So then beyond that, this island was very significant to the Napui Iwi as a coming of age ceremony. So young men, and yes, just men, uh, because it, as in many traditional societies, it was male-dominated. Uh, the coming-of-age ceremony for men in this iwi would be to walk along Cape Brett, the long peninsula near uh, Rafiti, or the town that they were living in, uh, swim out to Motukokako, which isn't super far, um, but it's still not an easy swim, climb way up this 200-meter-high island with no beaches, no easy handholds, anything like that, climb all the way up and go and collect feathers to make their kahu huru huru, which is like a feather cape, a feather cloak. It was a traditional symbol used to represent uh, mana, or power or prestige. So, so you would have to swim out there, collect these feathers from the kokako, and make your kahu huru huru. That's not an easy task. That's a lot of feathers you're going to need to be able to do that, and it probably took at least a few days for someone to be able to do it. You'd have to be able to survive on your own on this island, possibly in really tough weather throughout this whole time, and then swim back. Not an easy task. So what does that tell us? What, how does the Mataronga Māori teach us anything in that? Well, it tells us there are enough of the kokako on the island that you're able to make a cape out of their feathers. So that's, that's pretty informative. It tells us how we'd be able to get up the island, which is very useful. Now we use a helicopter to get onto it, uh, but how are we able to set up the landing pad for the helicopter? Because someone had to land it the same way and climb up and put up a pallet right there for the helicopter to land on. So it's very useful to have that knowledge that, hey, you actually can access this island, and this is the place to go to get onto the island. The island was also used for mutton birding, or the collection of seabird chicks when they're at their fattest stage, their chubbiest stage. Uh, 
you would collect them for their oils as well as to use them as meat. You could slide a towel through uh, through their stomach and it would get all the stomach oils that have been developing in there. And it's useful for like torches and burning fires, those sorts of things. And then they were a delicacy to eat as well. And it was pretty standard to have at least one mutton bird on the table whenever you're eating, particularly for more significant feasts. So that also tells us there are seabirds out there, there are mutton birds out there, and in particular that would be shearwaters and oe, or the gray-faced petrels, gray-faced petrel, or the oe being the primary uh, mutton bird in the area that they would be going after. So it tells us it's a dense enough population that it can actually support harvesting. If it was just 10 birds or so, just one harvest would wipe it out. So it's telling us that it's a very significant population of them there. And then many of those traditional uses of the island were discontinued with European colonization between uh, fights over land rights, between mutton, bird ra mutton birding rights, um, just generally conflict, and then more recently Orahui, or a traditional ban on the collection of birds from the island, and that was because the population of those birds was declining. Uh, we don't yet know, because there hasn't been much studying done on it, that's what we we're doing, uh, we don't know particularly what the reason was, but it probably was over-exploitation by humans, uh, as well as just increased disturbance of the area and the decline of fish stocks that they would be feeding on around that area. So what we're doing is trying to give back. We're trying to help protect these, these sacred islands. We're trying to protect these sacred, important places to the Māori people, and in this particular case, to the Ngāpui Iwi. So because the Rahui was in place, and no mountain burning has taken place in so long, many people didn't get to go out and do those traditional activities that are a major part of their culture. Um, so we're trying to help understand this, as well as teach some of these practices. How do you find the birds? How do you get them out of the burrows? What are some of their calls? What are their behaviors? What are the time of the year that the birds will be there? So that if the opportunity does come up for them to resume button birding practices, the knowledge would be there. It wouldn't be permanently lost. And it certainly is ironic to have, you know, a Texan come in and assist with this. It's not my culture at all. Um, I'm learning some of these skills from academia, from science and research, and pakeha, or uh, non maori people. So it certainly is ironic there to be going in and telling people this is the traditional way to do it. And that's why I've tried interacting with the iwi at every opportunity. Try to gain their appreciation to it and incorporate those values. And then with the modern twists of how do we monitor populations to make sure harvests are at healthy, sustainable levels? Uh, how can we improve these practices for the welfare of the birds, as well as human safety, efficiency, um, and just generally improving the practices while still maintaining traditional customs? And then more directly, more practically, there's a tourism dispute for this island. So its English name, it's what, what is commonly known as for tourism, is the hole in the rock. And that's because the island has a hole in it. It looks like a giant rock sticking out of the ocean. So that hole, uh, tourist boats like to go through that. Um, and because it's not technically landing on the island, they don't have any obligation to pay the iwi. They don't have any obligation to go through any of the, um, the cultural practices that are associated with entering these lands because they aren't technically touching the land. They don't pay the iwi anything even though it is their land. So that's caused a major dispute and it's being brought up in the land courts here with the Treaty of Watangi, which is the founding document of the country that says uh, Māori lands will not be infringed. So this dispute is currently in the courts. The way this is being countered by the iwi is to essentially have an iwi endorsed tourism activity for the area and that is people paying the iwi and a helicopter company to land on the island. And that one is endorsed by the iwi. The iwi have control over what the people do. Uh, they get paid for it, it's their land, uh, and it's generally a more culturally sensitive one where they receive the blessing of the iwi before they enter this land, as opposed to the tourist boats that just go through and more or less ignore all the cultural practicalities to, uh, to this island. So what we're trying to do is monitor the bird populations to make sure those tourist activities aren't negatively impacting the islands. Make sure that the birds are still breeding, they aren't leaving in the presence of humans, that there's still food, that the environment is being destroyed, the habitat isn't being destroyed, burrows aren't being stepped on and crushed, there aren't any negative impacts like that. And with that sort of surveying to it, we can monitor, okay, things are starting to decline, we might need to pull back on the tourist activities on the island. So you have to be able to have that baseline, because if five years from now there's only ten birds breeding on the island, if we didn't have the information now, we wouldn't be able to say that that's because of the tourism. So you have to have the baseline when the tourism is starting so that as it progresses you can see if there's changes. And that's what we're doing. We're continuing those surveys and it's done twice a year to just check on the burrows, check on the birds, make sure that things are going as they should be. So the actual work. 
Um, first, I just drove up to Rafati, which is the town that we stayed at the night before. It's about four hours north of here, mostly dirt roads, back roads, some really rough driving, especially for my tiny little hybrid car. Yeah, it was, um, it was some rough driving. We met at the Marai, or the uh, traditional meeting house. I, I'm not allowed to enter, it's just for the iwi, but I just met out front and when they arrived, they brought me up to the house and it was just a little field camp that they hand built, solar powered, off the grid, like completely off in the wild, which was really cool. Um, we camped overnight and then in the morning, the chopper arrived for us. But first, we're entering tribal land, we're entering sacred ground. So we had to receive a blessing from the iwi and a representative of the iwi, Blandy, came out and he did all our blessings, explained to us the cultural significance, how it's important to him, how it's important to the hapu, or the sub-tribe, and to the iwi, or the full tribe. He explained all the significance of these places, why we were doing this study, and gave his blessing, and subsequently the blessing of the iwi and the hapu. So then we got into the helicopter, it was just about five minutes out to the island, absolutely stunning scenery. We could see all the seabirds and seals, and uh, I thought I saw a whale in the distance, but it might have just been a boat. Uh, it was a really awesome helicopter ride. The team that went out there was some students and a professor from Massey University, uh, further south in the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, me, some representatives of the Napui Iwi, and in particular, my little field technician, 11-year-old Te Tonga. Uh, he was awesome. He gets to do this sort of stuff all the time, apparently, which is pretty, pretty dang cool that he gets to do that. Kind of an outdoor classroom for him. So he gets to go do all this field work with kiwi and seabirds and uh, plants and lizards and everything. Really cool stuff and he was so excited and so helpful. So getting to the island, we just landed on a little wooden pallet that they had built at the top of the island. The island's about 200 meters high, but very, very small, so it's extremely steep. There is nowhere safe to land, so they had to flatten out the, the top part and put down that pallet. And pretty, pretty close to the trees when the helicopter was landing. Uh, thankfully, experienced good helicopter pilot doing that. And then we split into two teams. One was doing the cultural work, and one was doing the bird survey work. So the cultural group was some of the Massey students and the members of the Iwi, and they went to one side of the island and looked at the lizards, looked at the habitat, uh, looked up at the pinnacles, which were these like rocky spires on another part of the island. Uh, they checked out the burrows, they learned about the history of the island, and mutton birding, and the land disputes, and all those sorts of things. And then I went with the bird survey group, and we went to the other side of the island. We went down the very, very steep cliffs with lots of slip and falls, thankfully no injuries, or no major injuries, they just have like some cuts and stuff. Um, yeah, and we went down that cliff and we checked the burrows. We found one chick on that side, a few eggs, and a few active burrows that we couldn't confirm anything was in. Uh, after we finished up on that side, because we just have three hours on the island, that was what the Iwi offered to us. They said, you have three hours, do your work, get off the island. So it took us about an hour and a half to do that side, and then we rushed up the side, went to the other one over to where the cultural team was working, and showed them how we did our work. So we have the modern way of handling these burrows and the traditional way. We started with the modern way just to get our results in. We have a limited amount of time and we have to get it done. So what that involves is you get your little headlamp, take a look into the burrow, see if you can see anything. If it's too deep then or too bendy, you might reach your hand in, try to feel if you can get an egg or a bird or something. And if it's still too deep, which it generally is, then you get this out. And this is a burrow scope. It's kind of like what plumbers use, but a really huge version of it. This sends the image and this is the camera. When you turn it on, it looks like this. Shines a little light in, and you can push it through about, I think it's like eight feet long, about two and a half meters. And it gives you a view into the burrow. That shows up on this screen right here. It's a really bad image, but it's enough to find the bird. So that's the modern way of doing it. But honestly, I think it's less effective than the traditional way, which is you find a long springy stick. Um, you used to put like something sharp at the end so they would get hooked into the feathers. I don't want to harm the birds. That's not what we're there for. Uh, so I don't do that. You just get the stick and try to get the bird to squawk. You poke the stick through into the burrow and feel around, try to get as deep as you can until you feel the chamber, which is the area that has enough space for two adult chick, or two adult oi, as well as the chick. And you feel around once you hit the chamber there. If you're not feeling any birds in there, then it's probably empty. You might be able to feel an egg, but that's pretty lucky if you have. And we explained the whole process to the cultural team as well. They got lots of really cool pictures and videos of doing all that sort of work. And they got a better understanding of this is how we've traditionally used these birds, how we've used this island, how we've engaged with this environment. And it was, I'm sure, a very cool experience for them to get to connect to their traditional practices in that way that haven't been practiced in a really long time. And particularly Tatanga was very excited getting to do all that sort of work. And so we finished all that up, headed back up onto the helicopter pad, and flew off. It was absolutely the coolest little trip I've done. It was just three hours, but it was so much coolness. We heard the call of a bird that hadn't been confirmed on that island before, 
Uh, we found plenty of birds, we found plenty of active burrows. It was really exciting, and especially getting to have that immediate impact. Being able to get Te Tanga involved, being able to get some of those representatives of the Napui Iwi involved, uh, teaching them those sorts of things, getting them excited about protecting the island, as well as providing that opportunity to have control over their own land again in that way, be able to control responsible use of the island. So I'd really just love to thank Napui Iwi for allowing me out there, Massey University for inviting me, and my little field tech Te Tonga. So thank you guys. If you have any questions, send them on. And I know in the past you've asked if I have like Snapchat or whatever, and yeah, I don't have that. Uh, whenever I'm on this field work and it's tough to make these sorts of videos, probably the best way to follow it would be on Instagram. I'm just posting up pictures of the field work as I do it. Uh, I'm sure if some of you would enjoy that, I'll put it right there. So thank you guys. I'll see you later.